Good morning, Year 11. Welcome to Virtual Learning. Um, thanks for tuning in. It's good to have you. Um, hopefully you're staying safe and healthy um, during this COVID-19 madness that we find ourselves in. Make sure you're keeping your social distancing, coughing into your elbow, washing your hands, and all that good stuff. Um, what I'm going to be doing with these... Um, or how we're going to learn now, obviously, is virtual. So how I've done it is similar to what I did last week. I'm going to post your week's worth of work on the Monday. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to try and do as well is post videos that accompanies each lesson. Um, and I'll put the links um, in the description for you. What I need you guys to do, though, is have your books ready. You know, your pens already, highlighters, syllabus, all the usual stuff you would for a normal class, um, except we're going to try and do it virtually. Um, so how it's going to work is I'll work through each lesson at a time. I'll let you know which slide I'm on so that you can have your laptop or computer or phone, whatever it is, in front of you at the same time. Um, and you can follow through with that. Ideally, um, that will work. Um, if it doesn't, please let me know. Um, I'm just trying to keep it as normal as possible and I think this is sort of one of the better ways that um, we can do it. I thought about doing Zoom um, and live stuff but I thought that might be too tricky with, um, I don't know, you guys might be sleeping into 12 or something. I don't know what your working from home routine's like. So I feel like this way um, you can just watch it when you're ready. You can get it done when you're ready. Um, and I also feel like you can then re-watch it and I think that's beneficial too. Um... So yeah, what you'll need today, I'm just going to jump straight into it. So we're going to start on lesson one. Make sure, like I said, you've got all your equipment out ready to go. Um, maybe pause this video now, get all that stuff ready, and then come back. All right, so pause. All right, we're live again. So, <coughs> question, I might just have some water. I'm feeling quite parched. So lesson one, what we're looking at here today is concepts, right? So we're starting a new topic um, called personal and social identity. Basically, what this topic is all about is looking at how you develop as an individual, how your interactions with society at a micro, meso, macro level form who you are, how that's shaped by your culture, um, all this sort of um, good stuff that shapes and changes who we are. Um, it's very complex, it's very in-depth. Um, so we're just gonna start with, sorry. I live close to the road and this bus comes by, it's really loud. Um, so we're gonna start with the concepts today. So what I want you to do at the moment, start off with, is get your syllabus out. Yes, you still have to use that. And go to page 30. Okay, now that you've done that, what you'll see is all the um, outcomes we're going to do for this topic. You'll notice it's 40% of our course time, so we're going to spend a bit more time on this than we did the last topic. This will probably go from now until the end of term two. Um, if we look at the concepts on the front page, you'll see that the fundamental course concepts, and our five core ones, and our six additional are still there. They're the same through every course we do in SAC, right? Even Year 12, it's the same. So that's why I really stress that you guys especially know those. Um, but what you'll also find just below that is related depth study concepts. So these are nine sort of key terms that this part of the syllabus uses. So we're gonna start with familiarizing ourselves with those so that as we go through, everything else is making sense, yeah? So what I want you to do now is open lesson one, Google Slides, and get your concept cards out. That's right. I know I can I can pitch you already, rolling your eyes, but get over it. Um, all right, so get your concept cards out. Here we go. <coughs> we'll start on slide, so slide one's just like a, um, I don't know, like a heading and the related dot points. So that's sort of what I, do. You've got your heading and then the orange text is the relevant syllabus dot point. So that's the bit that I want you to highlight in your syllabus that we're doing 
and you'll date that, okay? Um, today's date's the 30th of May, but you know, you might be doing this tomorrow or two days ago or, you know, last minute. I hope no one's doing that again this week. Um, but whatever it is, make sure you're dating it so that you're aware of when you've actually done it. Again, same as we would normally in class. Uh, socialization. So we're moving to slide two now. Okay, so what I want you to do on one side of your concept card is write the word similar to how we've done with other ones, socialization, and then flip it over. And then we're going to write the definition, which is the body of text below it. So essentially what socialization is, is how you, through growing up, learn to become a functioning member of society so that you're contributing to it in a positive way. Um, all of that's obviously relevant to your culture. So what it's about is learning and internalizing what I've got written there, the roles, norms, and values of society. So we'll start with roles. So by internalizing roles, we're thinking things along the lines of um, gender, say for example, um, is something that influences someone's role in society. The social constructs and ideas that we place around gender might influence how we grow up and how we interact with others. So for example, um, I identify as a boy or a male. That's my gender, right? Um, if I'm internalizing those roles, I'm thinking really long-term um, is being a father. I'm also thinking of the stereotypes surrounding that gender role. You know, I have to be masculine, tough, um, hide my emotions, all that sort of stuff, right? Those sort of really generalized um, stereotypical mythologies that surrounds gender. Um, in the socialization period, you internalize that a lot. So even in terms of jobs and roles, um, typically you'll see most trades, we even call it tradesmen, right? We don't really say tradeswoman much. Um, again, that's internalizing the roles that sort of males look for in society, right? Generally speaking, obviously that's not the case for everyone. And we are moving away from that traditional mold, but that's sort of the idea there. If for females, we're looking at very stereotypically internalizing the roles there that society is expecting um, for you to be able to contribute is things like um, eventually becoming a mother is the idea um, of our Western society anyway. A lot of the job roles and things specifically for women are changing. Traditionally, they were very domestic or um, very field specific and they sort of still are today. If we look at things like um, nurses, teachers, um, cooks, all of those generally um, predominantly tend to be women. Um, it's also the roles and again the characteristics we align. So women, um, you know, expect to be more gentle, kind, loving, nurturing, all that sort of stuff. So that's part of internalizing of the roles. When you internalize it, you are making sense of it. You are acknowledging it um, and then sort of acting it out. So when you internalize it, it becomes sort of um, locked in. Yeah, you become used to and accustomed to that role. And that's only with one sort of role um, in terms of, I've just looked at gender there. We could look at roles like um, your role as a brother or your role as a sister, mother and father um, in the micro unit of family. Oh, again, a lot of that's relating to gender, but it's all about internalizing roles. Then we've got norms as well. So internalizing the norms. So norms of society is sort of what over the course of your life and when you're shaping your identity, um, what society is sort of prescribing as normal, things that you would always do. So for example, um, you guys are born, you'll then go to preschool, primary school, um, high school, university, job, career, marriage, kids, retire, death, luck. That's sort of the norms of life, right? Um, most people typically will do um, a lot of those things. Um, in terms of, that's just one example again, by the way. In terms of values of society, so there we're looking at um, what is your society value, okay? If we're looking at a Western culture or even if we break it down further to Australia, um, we value like freedom of speech, a fair go, uh, we're very much like we looked at um, last topic. Western culture is very individualistic. We place our needs first, usually above the group. 
um, say other cultures like um, a lot of cultures in Asia are very opposite they'll um, be for the group first and then they focus on the individual but we're very much believing in through power or empowering the individual is the best way to further society right so that's that first sentence uh, there broken down if we look at the second part of that socialization occurs as a result of the individual's interaction with the agents of there's that bus again um, socialization agents so what we're looking at there um, is your interactions again when we're looking at social interactions we're looking at a micro meso and macro level impacts um, so you're looking at how you interact with what we call agents of socialization so an agent of socialization is someone that's really critical and pivotal pivotal sorry so they're really important um, in your personal and social identity so if we go to back to the syllabus if you go to page 31 and you go one two three fourth dot point down you see all these sub sort of dot points these are what I would call the agents of socialization so you've got family and kinship so your family being a predominant socialization agent you look at your mum your dad um, your siblings and how they are sort of what we call a primary socialization agent they're the main people that mold and shape your beliefs at the most critical time when you're developing quite young We've then got your ethnicity and culture and how that impacts um, your beliefs, your morals and things like that. So our Australian culture shapes that a lot. If we were to grow up in another culture and be part of other ethnicities, um, we'd be very different. Gender is another huge one. Um, I already talked about it before. Sexuality equally um, sort of defines those roles and how you're expected to act. So whether you're um, heterosexual, homosexual, transsexual, um, intersex, whatever it might be, that shapes how you identify with yourself and how you interact with others. Um, obviously your beliefs, so there we could be looking at things like religion, um, doesn't have to be religion though, it can be any other sort of belief system that you live your life by. Um, location, class and status is another one, so your environment where you grow up really does shape your identity. So if we look at, just as a brief example, Australia, we're very sort of close or most of us live close to the coastline okay and Australia has this culture of um, surfing and and you know beach bleach blonde hair tan skin that idea or that culture comes from our environment right if we didn't live close to the the beach or the coastline we wouldn't have that um, sort of thing similar with our bush um, stereotype you know that we're all living out back in the bush with those hats that have the flight cork things on them I can't remember what they're called you know we ride a kangaroos to school all that sort of all that good stuff um, all those stereotypes I suppose are based off our environment if we look at other countries let's say Switzerland for example um, they're not going to have a beach culture right because their environment they don't they literally don't have a beach right they do have snow and mountains and things like that so skiing is sort of part of their national identity um, as a result so that's location class and status we're looking at how you rank in society and what your power and hierarchy is I'll get into that a bit more later but usually that's determined of how wealthy you are um, and sort of how naturally privileged or underprivileged you are depending on things like if you're white um, if you're male things like that can give you a certain uh, edge in terms of society not that it should um, but that's how it's represented uh, your peers okay so that's your friends your mates whether you're at school um, or out of school predominantly when you're in school their influence is the strongest but even when you're out of schools they can um, help develop who you are second last one down is school um, so again we're looking at page 31 of the syllabus fourth dot point down um, looking at all these sort of subheadings. So school, again, is really pivotal and important in shaping um, your identity. You're being instilled with a lot of values um, from the get-go when you start school. Um, so that's really important as well. Um, even me, like, you know, I break off into Brownie's life lessons and I'll give you a handy, handy tip. So you've got those sorts of things, but you've also got the lessons that you're learning um, implicitly like that education is important 
um, you're learning social order, you know, you're wearing your uniforms, you're lining up, you're sitting down, being orderly, putting your hand up before you speak, all that sort of thing um, is really important in the socialization process because we're sort of trying to prep you for life outside of school, yeah? Stay hydrated. Um, and then that last one, media, including contemporary communication technology. So basically there we're looking at, um, we've got the news, um, we do have social media now as a huge force, um, and how they sort of shape you and who you are, depending on what you read and what you follow. That can shape your beliefs, that can shape your identity, how you act and portray yourself to society and how you interact with other members of society. If we look at contemporary communication technologies, that's when we're thinking of our phones, computers, the internet, all of that, and adding that into the mix now of how that's shaping our identity. Okay, We'll go into all of those in a lot of depth um, later, but that's sort of a, I think it's important for that to you guys have that sitting in the back of your mind when we're talking about this process of socialization you know this process of becoming a functioning member of society the process where we learn values and norms and roles and how we fit into society um, it's really important so I'm not going to spend this long on each one obviously um, but this is sort of the key pivotal concept that drives this entire topic so it's really important um, that we get a grip on that all right, so that's slide two done. Two sentences. Um, yeah. All right, so we'll move to slide three now. I've got a question there for you. I want you to write that down in your book and answer it briefly. It doesn't have to be long, <coughs> but what I'm looking at or the question is, how is the way you've grown up different from your parents? So obviously, um, try chucking some concepts where you can. The biggest one that stands out for me here is technology. Um, obviously, your parents' generation and mine as well, um, just because we're similar in age, um, or similar generations rather, um, could be quite similar. So I know my um, mum grew up in a time where there wasn't internet, there wasn't phones. Um, technology as it is now wasn't the you know mammoth that it is today so that's definitely one way um, that growing up is different from my parents um, another difference might be religion um, my mum grew up you know in a Catholic church um, going to church every day was something um, that everyone almost everyone did whereas if you look at today our society is becoming a lot more secular which is secular means separate from religion um, that's not to say church and that doesn't exist um, but a lot less people are going right and so in that way um, that's again different from how our parents grew up they had that huge um, meso and macro influence of the church growing up whereas today that influence isn't isn't as big as it used to be and it's dwindling so that's just two examples so if you wrote i don't know something like that obviously related to your parents maybe even ask them they might find that nice that you're interacting with them. Um, so yeah, give that a go. Quest, oh, slide four, sorry. So next concept is life stages and life course. Now essentially this is what um, are the sort of culturally defined successful or successive stages of life. What I mean by that is that you move um, and we've labeled this, all of these are social constructs, by the way. So like when we're born, you know, we're a child and then, uh, sorry, we're a baby. And then we move to being a toddler and then we're a child and then we're sort of a, a teenager. And then we move through this period of adolescence where we become young adults, but we're not quite adults yet, but we're trying and expecting you to act like one, like you guys are right now. Um, and then there is that process of adulthood. You've got, you know, your sort of young adulthood, um, and then your second part of adulthood where you're a bit older and you, you sort of, most people, you know, settle down and have kids and things like that. Then you've got retirement, old age, and then death, right? No one can escape that, unfortunately. Um, so when we're looking at life stages, we're looking at how we define those terms. We're looking at what sort of things we expect in those life stages as well. So for example, um, 
the life stage if we're looking at childhood through to adolescence um, we're expecting you to be at school during that time we're expecting this to be the most formative period of your identity formation um, who you were like now versus who you were two years ago is so different right but who a 45 year old is and who a 43 year old is relatively will stay um, unchanged um, so when you are younger those life stages come about a lot quicker because you're developing um, physically emotionally mentally spiritually even um, so that's what this concept's about just how we define those sort of life stages what age brackets we associate with them and what roles that and sort of expectations we associate with each with each of those so if you go to slide five you'll see i've given so the syllabus talks about from childhood to adolescence to adulthood to old age and then death right so there are five according to the syllabus five key stages of course you can break that down um even further but what this sort of slide is looking at again you should be on slide five is i've sort of given an age bracket of what i think that would look like so if we're looking at childhood again we're sticking to the five key stages the syllabus has given us because nessa and the syllabus reign supreme um, childhood ages 0 to 12 adolescence I've put ages 13 to 17 um, adulthood 18 to 50 old age 50 plus um, 31 over uh, 50 is watching this half a century is old um, and then death right is the final sort of stage obviously death can happen in any one of those stages but ideally, if we're looking at what society deems as your happy life course outcomes, um, it sort of flows in that order. So what I want you guys to do, my question here is, why do you think these age brackets correspond with each particular life stage? So what I mean by that is, why is ages 0 to 12 deemed as childhood? Why does adulthood start at 18 why have we prescribed that that's the number you have to be to be an adult if we look at you know a thousand years ago a lot of what we consider adult things now like getting married um, moving out of home being self-sufficient and autonomous a lot of that was done a lot younger um, like I'm talking people getting married at 12 and 13 and having kids then and that was considered the norm right um, obviously life expectancy was a lot lower then um, you didn't have as much time as we do now to focus on non-essentials as well so things like they would you know spend most of the time hunting um, just finding shelter basic sort of survival things whereas we have all that taken care of so we have a lot more time um, to explore other things right so in terms of back in the day they'd have to get a lot more mature a lot quicker because it was essential for their survival whereas today we don't have to do that so I want you to sort of think about I mean don't write that in your answer that's just like a little history thing for you um, but I want you to think about why you think these age brackets correspond with their particular stage so for me what I would say is a lot of these earlier ones are sort of based around school and those life stages so if we're looking at childhood that's a very um, preschool primary school they're the sort of really important formative years where you're learning how to count how to spell what the colors are what sounds animals make right um, right and wrong basic concepts of good and evil things like that is sort of defined in that childhood bracket if we're looking at adolescence again we're looking at the next stage up where you sort of um, more closely in high school and you're preparing yourself for when you're going to enter society by the time you finish high school when you become a fully fledged adult when you hit 18 so for me a lot of these age brackets correspond with school and those life stages um, so you could, I mean, maybe you could look at something like that if you have a different idea of it that's fine um, 
Roles and status. We're on slide six now. So, basically what this is looking at is the roles and status that we have in society. And we're looking at the social expectations attached to each of those roles. Um, and that's including rights and obligations associated with that position. So, if we're to look at, say, the role of a family, the social expectation is that they're very supportive of you, um, that they're sort of your primary uh, go-to whenever you have difficulties. They're also the primary go-to whenever you have good news. Um, their status is really high, or should be, um, in terms of how we view them. If we look at roles within those families, mothers and fathers, they d typically have an expectation that they're going to nurture you and, and take care of you, you know, put food on the table, things like that. Your role then as a child, according to them, um, you know, is to, to grow up and be the best version of yourself that you can be. Um, if we're then looking at, you can look at roles and status outside of that, even at school. Um, my role as a teacher is to educate you, um, is to help shape and mould you, um, particularly your identity into a way that's going to help you function the best that you can when you do leave school, when you get into society. My status and how I'm viewed in society probably depends on who you ask. Um, but I'd like to think it's, it's, it's high up there. Sort of, a lot of jobs have different statuses. So like, I remember we talked about this the other day when we were looking at um, power and authority. If we look at, say, a doctor, their status in society is quite high. Their role is quite high. They've got a lot of authority, even outside the medical field. Like a lot of people will listen to a doctor's opinion over someone else's because their, their status is a lot higher than them in the sort of hierarchy that we have. Whereas if we look at a garbage collector, um, they might have a more educated opinion on a topic than a doctor, but typically because of how society perceives them and that type of individual, um, they're not seen as important, right? They're lower down on that status rate. So when we're looking at roles and status, we're looking at the roles that people perform in society we sort of measure their contribution to society. So doctors, we um, value their contribution typically a lot more than we would garbage collector, even though without both, um, we'd be screwed, right? Um, they're just important in different ways. But typically when we see that, we make that assertion. And that's because we've grown up to think that way. That's been molded um, by us from a young age. You know, no one's sort of pushing to become a garbage collector when they're in school, right? people don't have that aspiration because we're told it's not something to aspire to whereas I'm sure if we were and there was degrees on it you know not that there ever will be probably but then it would be seen as high importance so again roles and statuses that we put on jobs and professions and our roles in society um, are very much socially constructed like everything else in the world so that's six we move to seven Got three questions for you here. You beauty, Mr. Brown. So first one is what's your role and status at school? So that's the student. Um, I'm pretty sure um, I'll leave that one to you guys to answer. Um, what's the teacher's role and status at school? So my role, for example. What am I supposed to do with you guys? And then lastly, can your role and status change depending on where you are? Okay, so that's looking at the concept of environment. So typically, say a teacher here in Australia is very is viewed very differently to a teacher, say, in South Korea or Japan. Um, their sort of role and status there, even in Scandinavia, um, are on the same level, um, if not higher than, than doctors and lawyers and things like that. Um, whereas that role here is seen as a lot less. If we even look at the role of an engineer, for example, in our country, Australia, that's a pretty high up job, right? Um, but one of my friends told me she went to a wedding um, the other day and this guy was embarrassed, he was from America, he was embarrassed to say that he was an engineer. Um, so it's, it's interesting that different cultures and the environment that you're in can influence that role and status change. So answer those three questions um, and see how you go. Number eight. So we've got three to go. We're halfway. You. 
Um, so rights and responsibilities, okay? We're gonna break this down. So a right is different from a responsibility. A right is something that is fundamental, it's inherited, it's something that you automatically have that no one else can take away from you. So your right to um, express culture, your right to feel safe, your right to um, marry um, sort of whoever you like, your right to practice whatever religion you like, all of that, um, as long as it doesn't impede on the human rights of other individuals, is fine. So that's what a right is in terms of when we're trying to make that more sacky or looking at society and culture, we're looking at sort of a lot of the social rights that people are given as individuals to express their culture. Um, so things like practicing religion would be a big one. Um, things like, um, you know, if we're looking at portraying social rights and things, when we're looking at um, marriage equality, if we're looking at gender equality, all of those are sort of rights that link with our course really well a responsibility though um is sort of how do i put it so here i've written the ability or responsibility to act or make decisions and being accountable for these decisions um it's sort of what's expected of you it it can link a lot with roles and status so if we're looking at the status and role of a doctor that comes with certain rights and responsibilities right so the doctor has a right there um to you know prescribe you medication um they have a right to perform surgery that they're qualified on they have a right to give you medical advice right their responsibility though is to do that in a way that doesn't harm you um that's best for you um and to do it in a manner that's professional and ethical right so that's their sort of responsibilities that come with those rights. As a teacher, for me, oh, let's, no, let's do you. So as a student, you're right. You have a right to an education. You have a right to learn. Your responsibility with that, though, excuse me, is that, you know, you're going to be a positive influence in the classroom. You're not going to behave negatively. Um, you're going to get all your work done. All of that are the responsibilities associated with that right of being a student and having an education. So with that being said, question nine, or slide nine, sorry, is how do rights differ from responsibilities? Can you think of an example? So I just gave you that doctor and student example. You could do something similar to that. Um, you might want to do a teacher or a parent, um, whatever it is. So a parent, like they've got the right um, to have authority over you until you're 18, but their responsibility there is to not abuse um, that right. And all right, so now we've done rights and responsibilities, moving on to class. So basically what class is, again, this is slide 10, is we have a system in society where everything's organised in terms of a hierarchy, okay? So what I've done is I've drawn this little thing in which shows sort of a hierarchy of society, okay? So copy that down if you can. You've got lower, middle and upper class, okay? Obviously, the higher you up you are, the more roles and status that you have, the more power and authority you have. When we are looking at class, though, or social class, there are three things that we can measure it off. They're based off power, so your ability to influence people, um, whether that's positive or negative influence. Um, you can probably think of many examples there. Privilege, so privilege is things that you are inherently born with, um, or things that you've gained since that give you certain advantage over other people. So for example, the fact that I'm white and male gives me a lot more privilege than say if I was black and male. Okay, Historically, and it shouldn't be the case at all, um, but historically speaking, um, and a, a lot of the different countries and cultures you can see it today where racism is pretty rife, I would have more privilege than they would. I would have an advantage. Okay. Um, and of course that's not right. And if we look at um, gender and we throw that into the mix, being a male, typically, again, if we look historically, and then now it's only really in the last 100 years that women are starting to become more equal, um, which is a good thing, don't get me wrong. Um, but typically speaking, I would have a higher privilege sort of status than them. Um, and again, that's a social construct that humans have created over time. Um, which isn't right. We should be 
equal. I want to make that clear. Um, and then the last one is wealth. So how much money you have um, typically um, gives you a lot of power and status and roles and authority, right? So if I was to be, um, let's say, a white male who's a doctor, I've got tons of wealth being a doctor. I've got a lot of privilege in terms of my position in society plus being you know, the white and male. And then in terms of power, um, indeed authority as well, being a doctor, I naturally can influence people. Um, so that being said, that sort of class, it's where you rank on that sort of pyramid. With slide 11, what I want you to look at um, is there are sort of two questions here. One is what social class do you think you belong to? So when I ask that, I'm referring to this pyramid here. Do you think based off your own power, privilege and wealth, you are a lower class, middle class or upper class? Okay, I want you to make that judgment call. Okay, if I was to give a brief example, I would, in terms of jobs, I would say a doctor is upper, teacher is middle, garbage collector is lower, right? in terms of if we're looking at jobs, but I want you to consider all of those three things and tell me where you think you sit. Um, and then the second question, I want you to look at whether you think whatever role you have, whether you're lower, middle, or upper, um, whether you think that gives you more privilege than most people, okay? Or whether you think it gives you less or whether it think it's neither here or there, okay? I want you to make that call. That's the two questions on 11. Slide 12, ethnicity, last one. Um, don't get this confused with race. A lot of people do that. So race has definitely those connotations um, of racism. That's where the word comes from, where people are seen as superior to another based off things like the color of their skin. Um, when we're looking at ethnicity, we're looking at your identification or a sense of belonging to an ethnic group. Okay, Usually that's based off the environment you come from and the culture of that ethnic group. So say, for example, if we look at um, different cultures around the world, um, a lot of them have similar ethnic backgrounds in terms of their beliefs and culture might be similar. Um, and so when we're looking at that, we're looking at a lot of where you're from. Okay, so my ethnic background, for example, is predominantly Australian, but I've got roots um, in Ireland as well as um, Norway, which is in Scandinavia, right? So my ethnicity and where I'm from may shape what I physically look like in terms of my genes and things like that, um, but it can also shape the types of culture and practices that I engage with as well. So what I want you to do is then move on to question or slide 13, sorry. You've got two questions there. First one is... Do you have a sense of belonging to your ethnicity? Now, I just ask this because I know a lot of people um, that don't, and that's fine. Um, so, so let's say your ethnic backgrounds, I don't know, France or French, right? You might not have anything to do with that, and that's okay. So I just want you to sort of label what you think it is. If you're unsure, ask your folks. If they're unsure, ask your grandparents, but only Skype them. Don't see them in person. Um, you know, COVID-19 and all that. Um, and then the second one, what types of culture can be created based off ethnicity? So this one, I want you to sort of look at different cultures and ethnicities around the world and try to find ones that are similar to each other and if they have created a type of culture. So, for example, if I was to look at the ethnic and cultural background um, of Islander people, so I'm thinking like Fiji, Samoa, Tonga, uh, Maoris from New Zealand, that sort of thing. They are all, and I sort of made this observation when I was in New Zealand, they all have like an unbelievable sense of music in their culture. They're all very musical people. So something or somewhere along the line, based off their ethnicity, they're all, most of them are very naturally gifted musicians. Um, their culture is heavily influenced by music, whereas if we look at other ethnicities, not so much. Like if we look at, say, European, yes, they have music, like they've, you know, they've got Mozart, which is you know, kind of a big deal but a lot of their sort of um, culture they're created in terms of like say architecture or um, like philosophy and things like that is quite rich compared to most other ethnicities around the world. So I want you to have a think about that.
Lastly, slide 14 is your summary task. What I want you to do there is summarize your personal identity in 50 words or less. Okay, so how do you view yourself? What are the things that make up who you are in 50 words or less? Okay, so what you should have done and what I want you to upload to Classroom as proof you've done this is all your concept cards and then a photo of your books where you've answered all those orange slide questions. Okay, and then um, upload that and send it through to me. All right, that's lesson one. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in the next video. Peace.